Uh, welcome, everyone. We have now reached day two of the Bright Eye EdTech Spark Festival. Uh, thanks all for being here. Um, and today we'll be diving into communications, marketing and sales with one session, this one covering strategies, budgets and KPIs. And the other one this afternoon, looking at building pro public profile and securing media coverage for all the good work that you are doing. My name is Sega and I'm head of community at Bright Eye Ventures. We are the most active edtech focused VC fund in Europe with interests spanning the sector from the early days to lifelong learning and everything in between. We partner with companies across Europe in your early stages, supporting you in pre-seed, seed and series A uh, with both investment and thematic support where we can be most helpful, at least what we think. The inspiration for this festival is coming from that work. We're very proud to present some of the best experts in the industry contributing this week with their knowledge and experience on a number of topics relevant to building and growing your startups. We hope also there will be some helpful conversations and connections made by all of you in the breakout sessions or questions section, depending on what we go for. So an important hour and a half ahead, and I'm very, very pleased to introduce you to David Guerin, principal and great colleague at Bright Eye, who will guide us expertly through this session on strategies, budgets and KPIs. Oh, hi. hi everyone, welcome, welcome everyone to the marketing session. Thank you, Hege, for the intro. Happy to see a fully packed virtual room. So I'm David from Bright Eye, and I will be trying my best to moderate today. So please be patient. Um, I'm a principal at the firm and being a former CMO myself, I'm pretty excited by this session, as you can imagine. Um, and I'm obviously truly happy uh, to have such great panelists uh, with us. So a massive thank you to all of them for taking the time uh, to share their perspectives today. Really, really appreciate it. We all know that distribution is usually a massive pain point um, for high tech startups and marketing is one of the key functions to unlock this blocker. Um, so today we're going to dig a bit deeper into uh, this critical function with the hope of helping edtech founders uh, in the audience improve their marketing efforts. So just a quick note for uh, housekeeping before we start and we let the floor to David from Growth, from Growth Tribe. We'll start with the keynote. Uh, you'll have time uh, to ask questions right after the panel. It's a conversation. Please mark that down. We just want to we're going to structure the conversation with uh, a few uh, questions, but feel free to ask your questions uh, at the end of, of the panel. Um, if you feel comfortable, please raise your hand and we we'll, um, and we'll uh, put you forward. Uh, if you feel a bit shy, we are not judging, it's all right. Just leave your questions in the chat and we'll get to them. So um, as, we, uh, as I mentioned, we'll start with the first keynote with David, co-founder of Growth Tribe, and then move on to the second one uh, with Matty, co-founder of CoachUp. So without further ado, let's welcome David on stage. Hey, David, you're on. The floor is all yours. Thanks, David. So French David handing over to French David. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so let's, yeah, let's kick off. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the intro. Uh, excited to be here today. Uh, I always love anything that's organized by uh, by Bright Eye, whether it's content and first time in, I participated in an event. So uh, thanks a lot. Um, my name is David Arnoux. So I'm a co-CEO, co-founder of a company called a Growth Tribe. Uh, in a nutshell, we deliver online courses and certifications at scale in marketing, data, leadership, product management, and, and more. So digital courses by digital experts for people who want to essentially win uh, in the digital space. Now, when David reached out uh, from Bright Eye, he kindly invited me to do a keynote around marketing in the ed tech space. I struggled a bit with that, but I've tried to make this as high level inspirational as possible. Um, but like anything growth tribe it's kind of fast. I'll try to keep it engaging and uh, make it as actionable as possible. Sorry if for some of you, this stuff is really obvious uh, or if it's not practical enough, but uh, probably some good reminders in what I wanna share today. Maybe not. Maybe it's all terrible. Uh, let's see. So today we're going to be doing 13 tips in 13 minutes with, let's say, two, three slides around context. Uh, before that, see if we all agree on the context uh, that we're in. So a bit of context to begin with. Um, our space is still hot and amazing to be a part of. 
uh, I like to call it short fuse. It's being disrupted. Big bang. Uh, the global impact is going to be uh, enormous. I think I stole that from Bain or something weird like that. Uh, it's a typical market that's exciting to be in as it's a market that's shaping itself. Uh, as Bright Eye has kindly shown us in their reports, which we devour uh, relentlessly, uh, money is flowing in at high levels, both on the, the global stage, and we've also seen a huge lift off uh, in Europe uh, recently, which is fantastic, but it also means that with big market op and big opportunities comes a big crowd. This also means that, as you know, there's more consolidation, more players, more competition, more strain on your KPIs, because essentially there's more people fighting for the attention in our attention economy of the same bag of uh, customers. Now, more cash flowing into ventures than ever before with higher valuation multiples than ever before, although this has calmed down a little bit recently, but companies still have lots of cash lots of dry powder. It's put, this puts extra pressure on marketing growth functions uh, within startups, uh, SMEs, but also large corporates, by the way, uh, but also us as uh, CEOs. We have this pressure to perform. And there's a lot of dry powder in marketing budgets at the moment. We see that at the same time, ad spend has never been higher. Uh, everyone's rushing online during, it was rushing online during the uh, pandemic that didn't help and this is across industries by the way this is not specific to ed tech which again makes our commercial goals much more difficult now with all of this in mind i believe your two riskiest assumptions as with many ventures are yes product number one building the world's best product customer experience to soothe the huge pain that they have but also to a very large extent how do we market this uh, how do we acquire customers at the right cost and retain them? And that's where these sort of 12, 13 tips uh, from today are. It's kind of messy, but, uh, and of course, all of this depends on your value proposition, your equity story, your personal desires, your business model, your, you know, your company culture. Um, now, where these might be interesting is I, quite, I coach quite a lot of teams on the side. I always try to coach three, four earlier stage startups. So I try to do pattern matching. Uh, and this is the fruit of some of this uh, pattern matching. So let's get into it. 13 tips, take them or leave them. First tip, it's really basic, but it's very important. It's Occam's razor. It's the idea that the best solution to a problem or challenge is often the simplest one. And in a world of 100 K, 200K MarTech tools and thousands of channels, it's easy to try to look for super complex solutions. Uh, most teams and companies don't even get the basics right. Your positioning, your tone of voice, your pricing strategy, your pricing strategy, your pricing strategy, and they already want to jump into psychographic personas or lead quantified, qualified enhanced um, chatbots, for example. So get the basics right. For example, again, maybe the best strategy to increase your revenue next year what if you simply increased pricing? What if you simply made your value proposition much more clear uh, to customers? I've seen this sort of endless times. We struggle with this as well. At the same time as simplicity, there's focus. Our scarcest resource is time. Our secret weapon is focus, 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 focus. Focus on the most important metrics that matter. I think we'll talk about that in a little bit. Focus uh, on uh, activities that push the needle, focus on the input that creates output. There's a really nice mental model that we all know. It's the 80-20 rule. It turns out that rule is a fractal law. Oh, somebody I think needs to uh, mute themselves. So this is a power law. This power law is actually a fractal law. So it turns out that there's actually 4% of input that creates 64% of the output. And there's actually maybe 1% of the input of your day-to-day -day work that's going to create 50% of the output. So the idea is where should you be focusing your time, your effort, and your focus? And I know it's difficult, but at least be careful with the sh what we call shiny new object uh, syndrome, which can be ex extremely de deadly for your time and for your effort. So how do you identify that 1% that are gonna generate the 50% of results? Well, number one is to be a genius, genius visionary that has the answer. Uh, I unfortunately am not one of those. I'm not one of those uh, leaders. I very rarely have the answer. So I tend to turn to the scientific method to uh, experimentation. I would argue that a team, a company should agree on one or two metrics that really matter and then place many small bets based on user insights and double down on the bets that work rather than making big costly bets. You create a culture of experimentation, one where it's psychologically safe and even encouraged uh, to experiment from leadership. And once you start scaling and need to double down, 
protect that fragile balance. It's a fragile balance between experimentation and process optimization. Um, for more on this, just read Accelerate from Cotter. It's a fantastic book that shares a lot of the insights uh, and, and how to address this. Now, to know what's working and to double down on what works, yes, we need to stay data informed. So whether you're focusing on acquisition, retention, referrals, revenue, you need to invest in being data informed. That means investing in the tools, the skills and the capabilities and the culture. It's a long-term investment. You won't see the results tomorrow, but this will create the difference between you and your competition on the long term. You'll have control over what works and what's, uh, what uh, doesn't work. You can't control what you can't measure. It's an expensive and difficult investment. It's a continual struggle, but it, it will even slow you down at first. Uh, but make that investment as soon as possible or, or else you're, you know, you're basically running uh, blind. Again, pretty obvious that we need to remind ourselves of this sometimes. Um, data isn't only conversion rates and ad spend, especially in marketing or commercial functions. The number one skill that I see across the board that's missing in not just our marketing functions, but also the teams that I interact with is typically financial knowledge. Uh, financial uh, acumen. Uh, so when you're running experiments, campaigns, internal process optimizations, it's a really good reflex if your teams are asking themselves, what's the financial return on investment of this effort that we're doing, whether that's bottom line or top line. And that means that your team should have a very big understanding and transparency in, you know, what's a PNL, what's a balance sheet, what's cash flow, what's a cash flow forecast, what are COGS, what's OPEX, what's CAPEX, at least those very basic uh, those principles. It's very nice when that resonates within the uh, org, but also, you know, things that are more obvious in customer and marketing related channels, which we'll talk about in a bit. What's your CAC CLTV ratio? What's my loaded versus or blended, however you want to call it, customer acquisition cost. Um, but essentially, what's the impact of this experiment, of this campaign, of this effort on the top line or the bottom line of the organization, not just on my cost per lead. Stay data informed, but also don't fall into the trap of wanting to measure um, everything or measuring it incorrectly. A lot of time, um, we spend a lot of time on last click attribution tools like Facebook, Google Analytics, et cetera, et cetera. There's this beautiful use case from Adidas a few years ago. Their advertising split was 23% in brand, 77% in performance. Now, a more precise, I think they call it, it was econometrist came in and they did an econometric attribution model exercise. And it showed that their split should have been 60% brand, 40% direct marketing. Now, why this colossal error? Well, they were using last click attribution or the attribution tools that are offered by uh, basically the, the ad platforms. They had an understanding that it was their digital advertising, desktop and mobile that was driving their sales. Uh, that led them to overinvest in paid search, for example. And funny story, uh, an error occurred in, its, in their Latin American market where there was a breakdown of Google AdWords and therefore inability to invest in paid search. And they didn't lead to a dip in anything in any traffic or, or, or revenue. They brought in a bunch of uh, econometrists, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They thought that most of their revenue was coming from loyal customers. It turns out it was mostly from first time uh, customers. Long story short, read the article. It's, it's been really insightful for me because I've, I'm so direct marketing in, in the past, short-term focused. Long story short, uh, careful how you measure things. And I'll, although it's hard to live by, I think your split should be somewhere along the lines of 80 to 20, 60, 40, brand marketing versus direct marketing. Again, I'm also talking to myself here because it's really hard to live by that when you don't have a massive uh, marketing budgets. What else works? Again, I like to do a lot of pattern matching, uh, some quite obvious stuff, have a great product for a big pain, uh, focus not only on existing, uh, on new customers, but also existing customers. I think the stat is it's eight times harder to get an exist, a new customer to pay uh, rather than an existing uh, uh, an, 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 existing uh, customer. Some things that seem to be quite obvious and work well in B2B sales excellence, relationship sales, account strategies, scoping your marketing, your market uh, account plans, uh, sales and commercial culture in general. Uh, like for example, how many leads have not got a phone call under 10 minutes after leaving their details on your website? Uh, you're leaving money on the uh, on the table. And of course, customer success and happiness and content marketing. I, I truly believe that all B2B companies should be media companies as well. In the B2C phase uh, space, sorry, uh, SEO, most of the time, virality, 
growth loops, viral growth, and same thing, content marketing, although at a different frequency and different channels, you shouldn't be hiring influencers to promote your brand. You should be the influencer or at least one of the key uh, influencer. Again, talking to myself, really hard to achieve all of this. Now, of course, you also probably have one channel that's not, that's up there, that's not up there and that uh, you, you're better than everyone else in and that's great. And of course, like anything, uh, it depends. Now, knowing, uh, how am I doing on time? Yeah, I still have a bit of time. Knowing which acquisition channels, tactics to focus on also greatly depends on how much money you can actually spend, right? And that's a good rule of thumb when confronted with so many freaking channels to choose from. If you want the full list of channels, you read Traction by Justin Mares. But if you're in a marketing function, you're probably um, already aware of most of these channels. So unless I would say you're blitz scaling, right? Uh, in which case you don't really care about uh, the cost. You're just, uh, you know, acquiring, 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 regardless of the, the cost. So unless you're really blitz scaling and taking over the world and you have unlimited cash and you don't care about efficiency and you want to eat and dominate everybody else, which is actually pretty rare nowadays, especially in Europe, it's probably a good North Star to understand your CAC bandwidth, how much you can actually spend for your customer acquisition cost. There's a beautiful mental model it was developed by Brian Balfour at Reforge. It's called the ARPU CAC spectrum. And it's basically rule of thumb that you can already eliminate a lot of these channels uh, by knowing what your average revenue per user is and going for a three to one CAC ARPU uh, ratio. Again, like many things, it depends. Maybe we can discuss this in the discussions uh, later on, the it depends part. Next tip, probably the most important of all, at least for me, it's dog fooding. We're in the ed tech space. We evolve in the knowledge economy. The single best investment you can make on the medium to long term for your teams is training and knowledge, whether it's management training, soft skills training, hard skills training. The long term ROI of capability building compounds similar to compound interest rates. Um, I do believe that it's your roles as leaders to invest in capability building. Ask yourself some tough questions. What's your annual training budget? How much time does your team spend on deliberate? structured learning per month and deliberate learning is learning that has goals clear schedules is challenging and where you've set time for that learning when was the last time you created learning goals for your team even 15 minutes of deliberate learning per day that's 100 hours per year uh, by the way the european average for deliberate learning is 24 minutes per week it's less than one percent of your your work week when's the last time your team you assessed your team's learning gaps and when's the last time you brought up learning goals in performance uh reviews do this for yourselves as well Boy. yeah i truly believe that uh generalists thrive in a specialized world because we're more adaptable uh, continue to explore, learn, but not only in your core area of expertise over here, also your width of knowledge. As I mentioned before, for example, your financial acumen, your financial knowledge. Um, if you do this for yourself and for your teams, I believe that you, your team, your department, your organization will become anti-fragile, uh, that you will not only become more resistant to change, but you will actually thrive from that change. And essentially you'll be able to be stronger than the competition. Not perfect, but one, two, three percent uh, stronger than the competition. By the way, also, I know I'm book dropping here, but also a fantastic book to read, uh, Anti-Fragile by Taleb, or you can also watch the one hour, probably a one hour interview uh, of him on, on YouTube and get the, uh, the essential of, of this notion. Um, on a little bit broader note, lastly, like this stuff's hard for everybody. Uh, it's difficult, it's hard. Uh, startups and scale-ups are living in the fast lane. It's chaos. It's dealing with imperfection, dealing with uncertainty. Our brains are not naturally wired for this. We hate uncertainty. We're all struggling. Don't worry. There isn't a single company where things are going perfect. I work with corporates, with scale-ups, with startups. It's chaos everywhere. And there's daily fires absolutely everywhere, whether it's fundraising, internal struggles, hiring, culture, performance, changing user behaviors, competition, lack of focus, egos. It's the same everywhere. Um, this is business. This is dealing with people. That's hard in a fast moving space. At the same time, this is exhilar exhilarating. Um, this is what we signed up for. And just note of positivity for the end. Don't forget that you're in an amazing space, ed tech, on an, an amazing, although difficult, but on an amazing journey to having impact. Uh, have fun. Don't forget that. 
this is maybe as good as it gets in terms of space and being in a scale-up startup. Uh, it's really amazing. And uh, don't forget to have fun, essentially. Okay, I think I'm just on time. Uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, of course, come and check out our uh, courses if you want to build knowledge in your teams. And on my end, the way I stay fresh is I always like to coach three, four startup scale-ups of uh, where I like I really like the business model. So it helps keep me up to date. So don't he hesitate to uh, hit me up after the talk or this week or next week. Uh, if you think I can uh, bring value, uh, I do it for free. It's just to keep me fresh. And uh, yeah, thanks for your attention. Thanks so much, David. Wow, I hope you guys took some notes here. Uh, he literally compressed years of knowledge into 13 minutes. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is exactly what we're looking for, for the audience, actionable insights. So thank you. I'm, I'm seeing a great uh, comment in, in the chat. Um, so yeah, th thanks so much, David. Um, let's move on to the, to the second one, to Matty. Matty, first of all, congratulations on the recent uh, fundraise. We've been in touch, but just want to congratulate you again, because it's big news for the, the whole European EdTech ecosystem. So Really, um, super, super glad for you guys, well-deserved. And um, yeah, the floor is yours. Thanks, David. Um, and thanks also to the other David for this super inspiring, inspiring keynote. And um, yeah, uh, I think that we couldn't, probably couldn't have more contrast in the two keynotes, so well, well planned. Um, when you were approaching me and asking me to share a little bit of my thoughts, I asked myself, well, I'm more of the generalist, right? I'm I'm more of the, of the CEO type of person. And then acknowledging that there will be happening amazing keynotes, um, super content rich like this. What can I add to this? And I thought about it and I thought, well, maybe it's a personal note of sharing a little bit of the expertise on one hand of my last 15 years as an entrepreneur, but then also of the last four years with coach and um, David, we've been in touch for a while. It's a crazy ride. We're having the, the time of our lives. Um, yeah, let's let's uh, talk a little bit of the stories that are maybe not so. Sure, let's do that. Thank you, Matty. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I said, let's let maybe have a have a look at the importance of sales and marketing when building your business, and with special focus on a past growth. Uh, environment and I agree blitz scaling it's not super European it's not really uh, what public markets are currently asking for but there is still room for rapid scaling um, and I think this is still very rewarding and exciting so a little bit uh, looking back at the last 15 years and um, when it was actually in 2006 I believe I launched my very first startup back then still at school um, in the in the e-commerce space, and ever since um, I've done quite a bit together with my now co-founder and brother Janis. And to, to be honest, there is only so much on my LinkedIn, but there is actually probably thirty to fifty startup ideas on top that never made it to the list. Maybe those were just weekend projects, but this very much shaped my view. On, on how to start a, a startup and how to look especially on, on sales and marketing. Because one um, key learning for, for me personally, and again, everything that I'm sharing is my personal experience, take it for what it's worth, is um, you have to test early and you have to get the market feedback ASAP. There is no bigger pain in spending years and huge budgets in developing something that the market maybe either doesn't want or doesn't want it like this. So our approach, when whenever we had a new startup ideas, and to be honest, some of them were very poor, but back then we thought they were smart, um, was test it, go out. Typically we would um, set up WordPress pages over the weekend uh, just after, right after having the idea. Sometimes a little bit more structured with doing some, some uh, benchmarking and market analysis before and sometimes a little less uh, structured and then maybe put some adverts on it depending on the business model whether it's b2c or b2b or setting up a sales outreach and setting up some cascades email outreach having some sales bot and get the early market feedback how do clients react what do they like what don't they like um i want to share one fun story also obviously what also to consider i know um 
actually we want it's many years ago to be honest we set up a website for car repairs um set up some lead generation campaigns and people were starting to call us with their cars being broken on the highway and um, that's when we realized okay maybe the sales and marketing piece works but we have no clue what to do or how to help these people so right maybe I'd rather stop these these projects um but interestingly also when we launched coach and we have um started thinking more concretely about um about launching coach pretty much five years ago um so and that was the process uh, if you go to the media if you read things you only see the result when did officially the company get started and so on which was in august um, 2018 but what's not in the media is that it was a process that actually took us one year to get to this point and we actually started off from a pain point that we were experiencing ourselves janus was running a larger sales organization and he really realized we've been talking quite a bit about coaching today how can he better coach his people in his own sales and department and he was he was actually not feeling that there's the support infrastructure he said okay so we got to build it ourselves um similar like always we would create a landing page would go out to market would set up outreach campaign um do some some good emailing and um, the interesting finding with this is we got immediately some very good feedback and um at the same time we then started doing our research so key learning here is do testing super super early similar like in the previous period do whether it's setting up adwords campaign whether it's doing uh, email campaigns whether it's doing anything start super super early you cannot start early enough don't care about developing the stuff first test well whether there's an actual need for it and um, it actually took us one year we refined it quite a bit we moved from sales coaching purely sales towards general coaching actually having two humans on uh, in our uh, community as well and then we figured out wow okay, there's a huge demand in the market and um, with i would say 30 50 different business models tested maybe it's even more we've rarely seen such a positive feedback in the clients and there's only so much you can do by googling doing research um what will actually fly and then at some point in time you just have to test it and you have to get the first hand experience and that's what was the key learning for me and that's actually how we do it whenever we launch new products whenever we enter new geographies whenever we know um, enter new client segments always start super super early you can never um, start early enough um interestingly when we then launched uh, um when we then launched um coach up four years ago um one of our first clients hello hello fresh i'm very close to them and um, i personally touched points with them for, for quite a while before we have been a bit overselling to them to be honest um we have been promising all these amazing dashboards that now we have them four years ago back then they were not fully in place so to be honest having this sales and marketing led mindset is probably the biggest stress that you can put on your organization because the rest of your team will hate it and um, they will sell they say you know what you are selling all kind of stuff we have to deliver it and actually you're putting such a big pressure on us because by asking the clients uh, offering services to clients then yeah you theoretically can move back but in reality we all know how it is if we're talking about big dollars big potential big stories we always talk to our engineers isn't there a way to make this work somehow so it is a big stretch for the organization at the same time i still believe this is the right approach um it's um, you have to balance um of course things very well you have to support your team you have to prioritize um but this little stretch this little sales and marketing little mindset i think it's probably healthy for an organization to have a high ambition level and plus to stay super super um leading in the market so reflecting then on our year one um i know quite a few players in the market who didn't have this um sales led thinking who had more product led thinking and don't get me wrong i'm a product person myself i love great products great usability um creating value at for our users and design but in our case it was the right 
thing, and it always obviously also depends on your market circumstances. In our market, super hot market, you have to move fast. Um, we were focusing on sales from day one, full speed at sales. Our competitors were focusing on building a product and, and a good product. And um, but then after one year, when we had revenue since our day one, basically we managed to already close two, almost three funding rounds while our competitors were just starting. And then that's the point where um, you have to, of course, pro uh, really balance things. It's fine because if you have clients, you need to ensure also the satisfaction. You need to ensure the stickiness. Your cohorts will kill you if you are having a high uh, logo churn and if you cannot prove the, the retention rates and DLI. Um, so it is quite a bit of mastery required, and I agree with my previous keynote. You have to be on top of your numbers, and um, I don't see a blitzscaling approach where money doesn't matter. Do whatever you want, but you can do rapidly scaling while being on top of your numbers. Um, and by doing so, this allows you to move super fast. So we. Um, basically opened up our operations here in Central Europe. We half a year later opened up operations in UK, France, Benelux, Nordic, Eastern Europe, Southern Europe, US, Latin America, Asia Pacific, Middle East, Africa, um, you name it, by having this clear replicable um, uh, sales motion. And um, as I mentioned earlier, in any geography, we would always start with the same approach. So, um, for example, when entering the Chinese market, obviously we would do a reach out to Chinese clients first. Is there a demand in the Chinese market? Um, would clients be willing to pay for this? And as soon as we would get the positive feedback, then let's jump on it and uh, let's uh, let's work with the team obviously to make to make this this possible. Um, so with with this in mind, now looking back um, at four years, David, you mentioned we just closed our Series C, raising $200 million from uh, SoftBank and Sofina. We're now 850 people um, around the world. Um, this is truly, truly um, rewarding. Maybe just a little bit on how times are changing, because as you mentioned, um, public markets are these days maybe more asking for efficiency rather than growth above everything. You have to be on top of your numbers. And the more mature your organization gets, the better you have to become. So obviously, early days, it's all about top line growth. But then eventually, you have to look at the, the um, efficiency. And we saw some of the formulas, which are probably um, great first approaches to check um, your sales efficiency, to evaluate what is your sales efficiency in different segments, in different um, industries, in different geographies. Um, so that's that's a little bit of this learning, um, but always keeping this sales first mindset. Um, that might not be true for every organization, for every industry. It definitely um, worked out very, very well for us. Um, and um, in any go-to-market, prioritizing this, um, making sure you at the same time measure your, your KPIs and um, you set the bar high. Uh, because if you really master a game, there is no limit. In EdTech, these day, giantly uh, scaling industry, um, the world is yours. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mati. What a journey you guys have. So thank you for sharing these great what tips, is. obviously. And guys, be on top of your numbers. Love this one. You're right. Because, uh, yeah, unfortunately, not uh, all founders are on top of the numbers. So, yeah, that's, that's a good one. Thanks so much. Um, if you guys are uh, okay with that, we can move to the panel. Um, so I'm going to call all the, the panelists to turn on their cameras, please, so we can uh, we can start the conversation. Again, as housekeeping, please, guys, ask questions at the end. I have two, three, uh, four questions that again to structure the conversation now, but. Uh, um, Right after, please, please, please ask questions. Grill us as much as you can. That's that's the, the purpose of, of this session today. So guys, super happy to, to have you on. Um, I'd like to start with brief intros so that the audience know uh, who you are. Well, David and Matt is pretty clear. Um, I would suggest Alex 
uh, you go first since uh, it's uh, 6 a.m. where you are. Uh, <laughs> and so please uh, tell, us, tell us more about yourself. Sure. Nice to be here. Really, really great to see everybody in the call. My name is Alex Sarlin. I, I am a longtime ed tech veteran in product and learning design um, coming through uh, Coursera, 2U, Skillshare, Newton, Scholastic. I've been in the space for quite a long time and seen a lot of different models. Um, and I now run um, EdTech Insiders, which is a newsletter and podcast about the EdTech industry, where I interview startup founders and investors uh, every week. So try to get a really holistic perspective on the on the landscape in the industry. Thanks uh, so much. Thank you. I, I'll just put the, the yeah, this is uh, the podcast, great podcast, honestly. So guys, you should definitely double check it if you haven't done so already. Um, should we um, continue with Rafi from London? Hey everyone, um, thanks Matty and Dave for those talks. Great, great to see those insights. Really appreciate it. And thanks to the Bright Tech team. I'm, I'm Rafi, uh, the co-founder here at Passion Fruit. Passion Fruit is the kind of Gen Z freelance platform initially focused on marketing. We work with portfolio companies from 72 of the world's to top 100 VCs and increasingly scale up companies as well. Um, in my former life, I was on the founding team of David Beckham and SoftBank's new soccer franchise out in Miami. Um, and it's, yeah, it's been a fun journey and excited to chat growth and marketing with everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rafi. And last but not least, Michael from London also. Yeah, also sitting in, in London. Hi, everyone. Uh, I look after marketing at Google for startups in the UK. Um, thanks to the... Yeah, for, for having me on. And I, I think those those two opening keynotes kind of show the, the breadth of, of the encapsulation of marketing. Um, so really, you know, excited to kind of dive in into the panel. Um, just for those who, you know, might not be aware of what Google Startups does, we connect founders with the best of Google's kind of uh, people, products and best practices. Um, and we do that through programs the uh you know the people side is, is is mentoring and i think one of the, the interesting things that comes onto the topic of you know what do you measure from day one is that in our programs we sit down with founders and over a kind of uh, three-month period go through their okrs and then because we don't sit in a product team at google we actually then based on their okrs go out and find mentors that will work with them through their time with us so it's kind of yeah one of the perks of, of being in this team so yeah my background is um in brand and product um so you know some people will call that growth uh and i know that the different levers to use at, at different stages so yeah looking forward to kind of jumping into the discussion with you all thank you michael thank you guys thank you so much uh david matty if you don't mind we'll skip your intros unless you want to add something here okay we're fine so guys let's let's start with this burning question right we have a lot of early stage founders here uh, in the audience and um Really, this is a key question about marketing. Is when, so when, when would you suggest starting to build out your marketing team? If we tie it to fundraising process, is it like, hey, POSID, at POSID, at POSERIS A? And the second part of the question is that who was your first marketing hire? Was it a CMO? Was it a marketing manager? I know it can vary depending, on, obviously, on, on businesses and so on. But, uh, but yeah, I would love really to understand like, what are your recommendations on timing? Because marketing is a, is a key one. Um, if it's too early, it doesn't make a lot of sense. If it's too late, well, okay, better than nothing, I guess. But getting the timing right is pretty uh, is pretty key here and tied to product market fit and so on. But we'd love to get your take. So yeah, who wants to go first? Happy to, to jump in here. Um, yeah. I, I think the question of when, when really pins back to something that Matty and David both spoke about, which is this financial component to marketing. I mean, the way to think about marketing is really a series of experiments that you're able to run and each experiment should be costed, right? You can't run an experiment without a sense of what you're hoping to deliver out the back end. I think in terms of um, when you then get it going, it really relates to what you're trying to achieve at different stages of your journey. So for us, a passion group, right? As a pre-seed startup last year and now seed stage startup, those, those metrics have changed. The goalposts have shifted, right? I think in the, in the earliest days, when we talk about marketing, you're really trying to do the thing that costs the least amount of money because you probably don't have any money. 
and you're trying to do the thing that can give you the longest um like term value so i i would really encourage people to consider trying content marketing for example because you can write marketing you can write that yourself you can you know use a freelance to do that pretty cost effectively and it lasts forever right we're still getting business off articles that me and my co-founder wrote on the first week of passion fruit that are still on the website so i think in the very earliest days the when is day one and you should be doing okay. something that's really cost effective yeah. well you have an unfair advantage rafi because you are like kind of a marketer at heart so being a co-founder being a marketer it's it's pretty obviously it's a competitive mode i would say but a lot of founders they you know like they don't have like these these marketing backgrounds or marketing really um uh, knowledge so that's that's in the, in this case sometimes it's a, it's a bit tricky but yeah you guys are a bit uh a, the good news that obviously good for you right but it's a bit of different animal and lucky that, that they have you on as, as a co-founder honestly yeah i mean i you know I, we definitely have that background but i would say like every yeah. founder is an interesting person by definition right and they should have something sure. interesting to say and I, i think just writing about something you're passionate about will attract other people and The distribution that exists today is so great that you know you've got to start yeah. somewhere. Thanks, Rafi. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to build on that. I think that's a really excellent point. And I, I would say that it really depends on what type of company um, you're actually building. I mean, we, we've we're hearing a lot of B 2 B ed tech um, represented in this in this conversation. I think that's really great. B 2 B ed tech is is a world where marketing and sales, I would imagine, would have to come earlier. The ROI is so much higher. The lifetime value of any customer is so much higher. Starting out with, you know, th there's there's more upside in having some serious marketing earlier. Whereas in my experience, at least B2C ed tech, you can get some decent growth through content marketing, through appealing to, you know, bottoms up from teachers. There's sort of a lot of different ways to get attention in B2C. Um, whereas in B2B, it's long sales cycles. It's as mentioned in the in the uh, in the chat, it's high touch. It's, you know, takes a while and expertise mm -hmm. to actually get in. So, uh, you know, B2B probably would be earlier in most of the B2C companies I've worked at. They although it also depends. So, you know, Skillshare, for example, is a B2C subscription based company but had a very large like marketing function, very large influencer marketing function wasn't wasn't, you know, it, it It took a while um, to get in place, but it became their main, you know, acquisition channel and uh, yeah. needed some pretty experienced marketing people. They couldn't have gotten that far. They didn't get that far early on with just um, sort of informal marketing or low level, you know, cheap marketing. Um, but yeah, yeah, that, that would be my take on it. I think B2B really changes the game in terms of when you need a marketing team. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Matty, David, Michael, any insights? Yeah, how are you guys thinking about that? The, the timing, really. Yeah. I can I can jump in real quick. Uh, yeah. Just very, very simply, I would say if you're B2C, I would hire what's called typically a growth marketeer, a uh, multifaceted marketeer, bit technical, bit of behavioral psychology, you can build landing pages like Zapier, a bit of copywriting, and even a bit of design. It does exist. Typically, it's somebody who's addicted to product hunt, And maybe has a personal small business, like they had a drop shipping business. And if you're going to hire them, give them a challenge of building a landing page and see how they do. Build a landing page, copywriting, all of that stuff. That's on the B2C side. And if it's B2B, I'd say sales. Get your first sales guy or girl, or salesperson. Uh, get your first salesperson in. Uh, and then the marketing needs will flow from, uh, right? B2B, you tend to be more sales driven. B2C, maybe you're a bit more marketing driven. In a nutshell, could be wrong, but that's, that's my view. Cool, thank you. Insightful. Mati, Michael, Mati, yeah? Sure, adding, adding just a few thoughts. So um, I believe it depends on your team setup. Um, sales marketing obviously is key in many, many business models. So if you're in one of those spaces, ideally the founding member of your team, a strong founding member of your team has a strong background in sales and marketing. Um, that was also, and uh, always in our case, a very very good for the business but also very good for the for the countries of knowing what we're doing and talking about if you have this seniority then your first hires can be more junior so i mean we didn't have any money at the beginning so we were building completely on interns in the very early days helping with the sales sales development um uh, eventually the marketing before that you have to do everything yourself i think that's the great thing that you basically can 
go very, very deep, very, very hands on as a founder and a founding team member, um, as well as hopefully have the potential to also do very high level and very strategic work. Um, one key learning, if I would restart the business, I would probably invest in marketing earlier. Um, okay. We have very much focused in sales and only later on realized that actually um, in the invest in marketing makes our invest in sales more efficiently. Um, so it's now part of our, our mix and let's do one, once more learning. Cool, thank you, Mati. That's actually one of the questions for, for uh, so the folks question about like creating this connection between sales and marketing. So that's that's a good one. That's a good segue. Uh, M- Michael? Yeah, I, I just love how we're all just nodding there, like B two B, the the role of marketing in in helping that sales process process speed up. Um, yeah, I mean, I have this have this chat because because I'm lucky to work, you know, with a portfolio of startups across Google for startups. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you know, reiterating what everyone's saying around uh, the founder and that founding team, because I, I always find it really interesting if you've got someone that is you know a great salesperson or is really strong at the kind of the ability to lead on narrative, like tick off some of those kind of earned channels, both in content, in PR, those bits. Um, they, they typically, having worked with a few people, bridge that kind of product marketing role, um, which I think also comes into like the balance between using, using and testing performance channels too yeah. early because i you know I, i'm definitely probably having listened to everyone's chat more of the brand marketer in the room than the person that loves doing the a b testing and, and and you know to david's point about finding that kind of like growth person um but i think it's kind of understanding in that go to market stage of you know your early stage and how you're validating and testing things the role of product in that like are you doing beta testing like like what is your overall go to market strategy and the role of products in that, um, and then I think there's just something really interesting that's been co- with, that's been emerging with some of the founders we've been working with recently. You know, like partnerships is always a really powerful role um, for marketing, you know, for growth. So in terms of both what your brand stands for uh, and and kind of the friends it hangs out with, but also acquisition. And I've been seeing quite a few founders finding very smart tactical partnerships mm-hmm. that drives acquisition, but does brand at the same time. So where, where I would have been, you know, three, four months ago being like, cool, you know, you're clearly the lead marketing person, bringing in a marketing mm-hmm. manager who's going to help you work with a small freelancer on the performance channel so you can start testing things. Um, and then, you know, find out who your key sales hire is because you can't be doing both because your product, you're, you've picked up marketing and your other co-founders in fundraising yeah. um, and ops is, yeah, is using partnership channels, not like affiliates, but kind of mm-hmm. uh, using partnerships as a whole to lean on for sales functions and brand, which yeah. I find kind of interesting and thought it would be worth worth sharing because it's quite easy to just get into kind of the nitty gritty of, um, yeah acquisition and distribution of your, you know, content measurement. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Thanks so much. And look, just like Maddie, you're bringing sales uh, into, into the equation. So let, let's let's move on to this question. So look, marketing and sales are naturally connected. You guys more the, more uh, know more than I than do, obviously. But in reality, we often realize that there is a disconnect, right, between these two key functions. Um, not always, obviously. But it's a, how do you guys think about creating this connection between the sales team, marketing, marketing team, to make sure they're aligned, right? Um, is it, are, do you have any tips? Because this is a big one, honestly. Even though it seems like eh, basic, it's a big one. So yeah, if you have any tips for the audience, that would be great. I, I can kick off with a bold statement uh, if you want, and then we can see if uh, I think they should be under the same roof. I don't think you should separate them. And I think there's no such thing as sales and marketing or marketing and sales. If it's sales and marketing, marketing will be the, the lackey of sales and the, and the other way around. And then maybe just call it revenue, I don't know, or a commercial or something. But uh, I would say never separate them or else you're going to be spending hours in internal marketing and alignment and all that crap. Uh, yeah. I, I love that, David. And I th- I've heard it described as... Um everyone in your startup should either be building product or selling product. And I, I think that's quite a simple way to think about what someone is there to do. And if they're not doing one of those two things at the early stage, maybe you don't need them. 
If I may um, say something, what I've noticed and I've read um, and uh, the Y Combinator often says, marketing and sales is literally a tax. So we as company founders need to really push our product, make sure that our users love it and it will come. And so what we've done at Gilo is really do the content marketing, do the landing pages, do uh, prepare for the sales. Um, release our MVP, get the buzz going, get growth hacking experts that are leadership coaches to mm -hmm. get us closer to getting the numbers out first to get the big revenue, not having to pay for all these things. My CTO mm -hmm. and I often fight about this. He's like, no, let's throw some money in, in marketing. And I say, no, my background is a market researcher, marketer, and I'm not going to throw money when it needs to be in really great tech. So that's how I look at it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Matty, any, any insights there? How are you guys thinking about sales and marketing? Um, yeah, thanks. And, and, and uh, we, we are investing quite significantly in marketing. Um, obviously, it's, it's always uh, and, yeah, the holy grail. How do you, do, how do you measure the, the ROI of your marketing spend? Um, but we came to the conclusion that there is uh, obviously clear correlation with impact on sales. There's benchmarks. You look at, was it marketing to sales ratio 6 to 10% of your budget? Um, that's at least uh, something that we are looking into and, and it's working quite well for us. We actually also did this change um, uh, where marketing is now part of our revenue. Um, organization and that really, really um, goes down well with the entire team, um, reducing silo thinking and the alike. Plus, we had field marketing embedded in the regions, which creates very close uh, alignment between the regional sales team and the regional marketers because they know best what is working best. And I, I mean, just just one example here, here in Europe. Um, Events in EdTech are always a big thing, something uh, you might want to consider. Um, but then, for example, um, in China, um, no need to invest in your website, in your website marketing, because everything is on WeChat. You actually need these local expertise, and that's why it worked well for us to really embed those in the local teams. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Th thank you. Michael, Alex, you want to I want to give you time, space, each one of you to answer. Just one, just one quick, uh, quick thought on this, which is that, um, so coming from the the product side of the house, a lot of the time, I'm a really big fan of the product marketing role, um, and it, it relates a lot to what Maddie was saying earlier about a sort of marketing led culture. You know that having being in alignment, having both the sales and marketing team be in alignment with the product team is incredibly key. They lead each other at different times. Sometimes marketing will, you know, will lead something and be sort of out front. Uh, sometimes product will be out front and we'll need to explain what they're doing. But uh, I, I, you know, it's just an incredibly important role that I, I don't see in as many companies as I'd expect, I, I'd, I'd say. I think, you know, starting with a product manager who has some marketing chops um, or vice versa, but then eventually sort of really having a liaison between the product and the marketing and sales functions keeps everybody aligned, saves a lot of time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alex. You're right. But look, we're forgetting about product management completely, the product managers and so on here. But yes, product obviously is a key part of the equation as well. Um, Michael, do you want to add something? Um, yeah, I, 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 echoing again what everyone's yeah. saying. I think I think the roll up. I think Matty to his point around um, you know the sales focus of the business and Alex's mm -hmm. point around um, products role in that. And I think yeah. the the interesting thing to remember is that your you know your sales teams are speaking to customers. You know, it's it's crucial that marketing are, are kept in that loop with product. And I always think that when you're having a conversation around sales, marketing, and product, it's also like where does your account management in a B2B or customer service sit and, and how does that come together? And early on, sometimes sales is customer success at the same time. Um, and the, the, the looking at those holistically is kind of, you know, to Alex's point, you know, like if you've got a really strong product manager, they are the voice of the user and they can work with that, you know, work with the marketing team to, to, to get that out into the world. But there's at some point where you just need them to be, you know, running product yeah. um, and, and start to pick up those those other pieces. Um, well, yeah, I, it's that kind of that. Cool. Great, thanks. And guys, if 
So I know obviously this varies completely according to verticals, countries, uh, business models, and so on. But uh, um, how do you evaluate? How do you assess with your marketing strategy? I'm not talking about well sales, depending. But let's focus on marketing for a sec. Um, how do you how do you assess whether your marketing strategy is working? What kind of metrics in your specific cases um, do you use to judge whether it's going well, not so well, or it's going wow out of the roof? So yeah, I'm, ju I'm just curious here, like kind of metrics that 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 you guys closely follow to understand hey we're on the right track or we are not. Happy to start. I mean, I I think yeah, go ahead. I think from from our perspective, like I, I would agree with David that they should be together. But if you had to split them out, I would think of a flywheel of acquisition and then a flywheel of retention. So in your flywheel of acquisition, the way I would think about it is what is your you know top of funnel inbound leads from marketing, whatever that part of it is. But I think the most important metric pretty much in, in every startup is utilization and how many people keep coming back for more and people call this product market fit people call this a lot of different things but i don't know a startup where that isn't an important metric to to kind of measure and, and keep on top of because net dollar retention in SaaS or you know um yeah. cohort analysis in marketplaces whichever way you look at this like this is the holy grail and, and it basically means that your whole business from product to customer success to sales to marketing it is working when people use it more than once Good. Thank you, Rafi. That's super helpful. Love the way you speak it, like the flywheel of acquisition and flywheel of retention. Really, that's pretty, pretty cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. uh, j just building on that, you know, I think the, the lifetime value to customer acquisition cost ratio, which has been mentioned a couple of times, is, is a really, really valuable metric for, for ed tech um, yeah. for a few different reasons. One is that, you know, ed tech models, depending on where they are, have to you know, lifetime value can mean something very different for a sort of a short-term play, for a subscription model, for a B2B year over year. Um, but knowing your lifetime value can really, really determine how much how much marketing spend you have. I was just looking at a quote from Go Student where they talked about they're, you know, co competing with um, other tutoring companies. And they basically said they have a way higher LTV than most short-term tutoring companies so they can spend, afford to spend much more. And they, they have like much higher... CAC than other tutoring companies, but they also have much higher LTV. So they, yeah. they, they really organize that and have grown enormously with that strategy. Um, one other thing that I think is kind of interesting is thinking about um, the, your sort of impact, your, your, you know, your, your customer base with different denominators. So it's like, you know, what percentage of companies in X country, what percentage of companies in this space in this country, or what percentage of school districts, um, you know, in the US, people often talk about, you know, we're represented in 50% of all school districts. And what that might mean mm -hmm. is that, like one teacher in one district uses the tool, but they're represented. And then they can go on the site and say, we're represent we're in 50% of school districts. And that makes everyone else feel like, why aren't we using this? And you can sort of use that. I mean, that's not an internal metric. That's a little bit of a, a marketing metric. But I think it is smart to sort of think about how you think about different groups and sort of what your what your impact is within groups. You always hear people about, you know, talking about what percentage of the, you know, Forbes 100, they are represented, things like that. You can cut that in many different ways and use it as a mark, as a both an internal metric and a, and then a, a play to, to go further uh, and market to, to others in that same group. Thanks, Alex. That's, 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 a, that's an interesting insight, actually. Um, yeah, Michael, do you want to say something? Yeah, I was just, I, I thought this internal external metrics are really, is, is a really good point yeah. because I think as, you know, like CAC and LTV are, are super critical and they're super critical when you're fundraising. But I think as, you know, I, I suppose it's I, Tom Hume from GV in one of our live sessions in 2020, I just remember him saying it and lots of VCs have said it, but, you know, like founders who ask the right questions and answer them at the right stage is a really interesting one because I, I have a lot of conversations with founder, founders who are like pre-seed and they're trying to like optimize their performance spend. And then you have a chat with them about like partnership as a distribution channel or other things. And you're like, whoa, mm -hmm. why are you trying to optimize this channel when you've got, you've got things that are on your radar that could get you to, you know, revenues of your, you know, what you're aiming for your next round. And I think um, understanding, you know, what is that lead metric that you're, 
that ladders up to your OKRs and what you're doing, but also to the story you're telling, both to investors and to the proof points that your product's working for customers. And I think that comes back to, yeah, the there's the business metrics and the financials, but there's also just how do you build trust with your customers? How do you prove that your product's working? And, and how to investors, does that all come together? Because you won't be able to answer all the questions at, at yeah. once. And it comes back to that focus point. Um, yeah. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. And, and then maybe I'll just chip in with one short thing is uh, maybe it's good to have a mental model of, uh, again, because pre-product market fit, post-product market fit. Mm -hmm. I always like to think that pre-product market fit, you're 80% validating assumptions and 20% tracking metrics. So it's more like pre-product market fit. What are my key assumptions? What are my critical assumptions? And it's about how can I validate that? And that's typically with a lot more qualitative uh, insights. So I do agree with the, with the point from Michael. And then post-product market fit, you're usually in those um, <clears throat> unit economics, uh, CAC, CLTV, CLTVA, RPU, contribution to overhead model on your, on your PNL. <clears throat> and be careful with CAC, CLTV. Some people do that incorrectly. So... CAC, you need to understand the difference between blended CAC, non-blended. So blended CAC is including all costs, including personnel. Non-blended, it's only your direct marketing spend. And that has an impact on your PNL, by the way. And then CLTV, people do it differently. We do it with gross margins. So we're not talking about revenue here. We're talking about gross margins. So you take your revenue and then you only take your, your gross margin there. I've even seen some companies that do it on EBITDA. Uh, but yeah, so oh, it's okay. also important to put those... Uh, to make those uh, definitions clear up front or else everybody's speaking the same, uh, uh, everybody's speaking a, a, different, uh, a different language. Fair enough. Thank you, David. Yeah, that's, that's super helpful. Um, guys, two more questions. Then We have a bunch of questions from, from, the, from the audience. So that's, that's pretty good. And I really want to obviously um, allow the, the, the founders um, to ask questions directly. I just have these two last burning questions. Uh, the, this one's really about um, the challenges. So, you know, like there, there's always many different marketing issues. Hey, I'm targeting the wrong audience. I'm running bad offers. I'm not creating a meaningful messaging, I'm focusing on wrong channels as we uh, mentioned and so on. So in your case, what is the current main marketing slash growth challenge? And how are you thinking about unlocking it? Just uh, perhaps that the, the, you guys have common uh, challenges, including with the audience. So I'm just curious about, yeah, your current challenges to um, to, your, to each of your businesses. The well, again, I get yeah. things off because it's um, as Landy mentioned before, and that's really it's the, the holy grail or our own marketing. Because when setting up our business planning, uh, obviously marketing spend is not factored into the model. So the finance team always comes and says, well, we can save a few million here. It doesn't change yeah. the model. Why don't we do this? <laughs> Come here with a no, perfect year ROI, and basically yeah. prove it is ROI. Okay. Thanks, Mati. For us, you know, we, we just raised our seed round in, in July um, and going from a kind of pre-seed company to seed stage companies when we were actually starting to turn things we did in a very scrappy way into a bit more of a systematized approach. Um, you know, I yeah. think it's really important to, to do things scalably and not just do things in a way that, you know, you can push a lot of energy into, but don't form part of a bigger picture. So it's really just setting up the team to do things in a, in a more systematized way. Thank you, Rafi. That's, yeah, that's an interesting one. Yeah, obviously. Yeah, it's about essentially structuring all the marketing uh, efforts, processes, and so on. Well, you guys will do a great job at it, pretty sure. So, yeah. Um, um, David, Michael, Alex. Uh, I, I can just speak on sort of behalf of a lot of the startups I, yeah. I advise. Um, the, some One thing that, that I think EdTech, a lot of companies at EdTech struggle with, it's related to a question in the chat, is sort of which and which, who are you marketing to? Um, because because EdTech yeah. has these complicated relationships. You have, you know, a, a admins, school, uh, L&D, you know, procurement people, uh, teachers, professors, learners, sometimes adult learners, sometimes parents. And, I, I, you know, the relationships are really important. And the word of mouth marketing is really important. So there's word of mouth marketing sort of from parent to parent within, you mm -hmm. know, homeschool communities. There's there's word of mouth between L&D departments within different, you know, European mm -hmm. companies. There's word of mouth between different professors. Uh, we saw that a lot at, at Coursera. So 
I think, you know, it's, it's a little bit unusual for ed tech in that you have these really deep, complex relationships, and you have this huge split, as, as Rafi was saying, between those who are doing the buying and those who are engaging and actually using the platform. So you sort of have to decide, are you marketing to the people, you know, directly to district administrators in, in schools that are going to mm -hmm. buy it for their whole district? That's a great sale, but then it's top down and you have no relationship with any teachers or learners and you're, you're sort of at the mercy of how they implement it. Um, or, and the same thing happens in B2B if you're selling to L and D, but they don't do a good job of getting your, your, mm -hmm. your product in front of their employees, then you're, you're not going to renew the contract. So it's a, it's a complicated, you have to sort of split your marketing and content marketing among different audiences. And that I think is, is complicated and relatively unusual for, for ed tech. Yeah, that's yeah. Th thank you, Alex, for mentioning that this is. I was in the a CMO in a healthcare uh, startup in, back in Mexico. Uh, that was, and that had nothing to do with with, with the edtech space, but uh, that was one of my main challenges because the end user was different from from the the target audience. Uh, targeting, um, I was essentially targeting sons um, or children. Um, for their parents to get eye care treatments. So that was a tough one, honestly, because the language, the way you say, you say it, visuals and so on changed completely. So mixing both was a constant challenge. That was a great one, but that was a constant challenge. Anyway, yeah. D David, Michael? Sure, I can, I can jump in. Uh, good yeah. question. Uh, so many. <laughs> Uh, so many, maybe yeah, can, just pick one yeah, or two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just um, uh, yeah, I'll, just kind of an obvious one. Let's say it's it's balancing the short term and the long term. Uh, especially right. now we're entering Q4 yearly budgets. Who the hell invented yearly budgets? They don't reflect reality at all. Yearly forecasting. You need them for investors, et cetera, et cetera, for the immune system of the company. But you know, um, so and especially in commercially driven companies where we are actually asking sales and marketing teams to also be product visionaries about yeah. what we should be building next. Um, so it's balancing the long and the short term. What I'm gonna start testing to fix this is I'm gonna put like short-term days, long-term days. We're gonna to try to put time slots where you put your long-term hat on versus your short-term hat on. Maybe it's a morning, something like this. Let's try to orchestrate that, but um, uh, yeah, short-term. Uh, what's focused on now because we still need to reach certain numbers and targets and you know retention etc cetera, etc cetera. but at yeah. the same time we need to prepare the uh the future and it's really really easy to, easy to do when you're not in execution we're not executing we at growth tribe almost everybody kind of executes uh but some execute less than others because they're more on strategy and long-term planning so it's really easy for them to come in and say we need your yearly plan when you're in execution it's you need to be pulled out right be able to put your long-term hat on and i think it's our role as leaders to pull people out of there and give them like a here's a morning for long-term thinking here's a week uh, and, and facilitate that let us know how it goes never heard of, the, of such practice so yes please let us know let's see Anyways. it'll probably be yes. painful and <laughs> yeah everything yeah thanks for sharing uh michael on the start of your advice at google yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, from a Google perspective, we're in, you know, in the annual planning process. Um, I think it's really mm -hmm. interesting, you know, from a marketing perspective at Google for startups is like the programs and how we run them and who we run them for is kind of almost our walking the talk as a, as a large established brand mm -hmm. and delivering on our narrative. So, you know, I think that's kind of where my focus from a from a marketing perspective is. And then with many of the founders, I think maybe it's just because I've worked in so many uh, planning cycles in you know different agencies and with different yeah. clients and 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 that is that I'm very much about what the roadmap is and and constantly mm -hmm. that that vision piece and so I think you know what I'm working with a lot of founders on at the moment is hiring around that roadmap and working out when are their storytelling opportunities and when are the the hiring and and how does that work for the you know the balance of driving acquisition brand growth hiring people and mm -hmm. fundraising and just kind of threading that kind of plan over a, over a period of time so that they can resource around it and kind of take the team on that journey. Um, you know, to Alex's point, there's many users and planning, uh, you know, internally is, is kind of, even if it's top line, getting that kind of roadmap of the next year from the practical people in engineering and product and sales, but working out how marketing supports that and how the internal and kind of external narratives evolve. 
is kind of what I expect the next couple of months for me will involve with, yeah. with our founders. Great. Thanks, Michael. Last question, and then we'll turn to the, to, to the audience. It's more like, it's a short one. It's just like, we'd love to um, always have this, like these two schools of thought in terms of, hey, should you look closely at what your competitors are doing in, in order to get inspired, quote unquote, or do you completely ignore them in order to be, or to create, like your, to craft your own marketing strategy that is unique and authentic? This is a tough one. I've always struggled as a CMO, do it, honestly. Uh, I don't have the answer, but I, but I would love to ask you the, this question. How do you guys think about competition? Is it something that you should look at or is it something that, hey, now they do their own thing and we should focus? As David said, one of the 30 tips like focus, focus, focus. I don't know. Um, yeah, what do you guys think? I'm I'm definitely in the look at and be aware, but not necessarily okay. stress out about it. I, I suppose I think it comes from you know my time in kind of creative agencies of kind of like looking at the competitors, uh, just understanding their sense of travel, uh, and then you know I'm a I'm a what can we borrow and reinvent from other categories? So yeah, um, I actually prefer looking at other industries rather than the competitor set for for inspiration. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it, it's good to be aware, right? Because you need to understand how their messaging is evolving over time. But that takes time, and I think it's just it's it's balancing, yeah, how deep you go and how much you Hawkeye watch every step versus just a regular check in to see yeah. what things are moving in your category. Um, would be my thing is yeah like a yeah not every day but kind of keep an eye on it Thank and then you, look at yeah. other inspiration. Yeah, I, I agree with with Michael. Just don't make it. I, I think yeah. I have a gut feeling there's a correlation, maybe a direct correlation with how well you're doing and how a negative correlation between how well you're doing and how much you look at the competition. So if you spend your day <laughs> looking at the competition, things are probably not going well. But yeah, you should definitely uh, keep an eye on it. It's those three C's, right? What is it? It's like customer context and uh, competition. Uh, and typically your number one threat in the SWOT analysis is usually threat of new entrants. Anybody can build a, a business nowadays, right? Really a business, a product nowadays. Um, yeah. So definitely keep aware, but it's probably a good, uh, a good Don't litmus get test. Obsessed. No, yes. the more you're looking at it, you know, there, maybe there's actually a problem with your product market but then. And uh and there's actually a problem with your core messaging or your core position. Cool, thanks. Matty? Yeah. Maybe stepping down on this, uh, I have to say I love competition, even though I hate it. Um, so <laughs> whenever, whenever I, I, I look at a, a competitor, this is, this is so energizing, right? You say, oh, now, okay, look at what they do. What are we doing? It sparks your creativity. It sparks your drive. It's energizing. I know uh, sometimes I've been in markets where there was no competition. I think, well, then let's come up with a competitor or something because I think this this can be such a powerful <laughs> driving force for you. And in the end, it's always good for the customer. It forces you to innovate. It forces you to create better experiences for the customers. Um, but long story short, while I think it's important to to take a look at your competition, draw sometimes on some professional learnings. Sometimes you can have a competitor switch test and then you leapfrog. Yeah or whatever, you have to realize that you are writing your own story. You shouldn't be following anyone because otherwise you're always going to be player number two. And if you want to lead, then you have to find your own path. Thank you, Marty. Thank you. Alex, Rafi, anything to add on the competition side of things? I would, I would, um, I'm just going to share this, uh, this link yeah. to the chat, which is a, um, uh, credit to my brother who once sent me this, but it's basically a look at how households subscribe to like the major video on demand platforms. And basically nice. what you realize is that um, your customers are basically the customers of other brands who occasionally buy from you. That's not my quote, but that's like a, a quote on this yeah. uh, topic. And I can't remember who said it, but definitely not me. Um, and it, it's, I think the rule of thumb here, right? Like, there's going to be people buying from competitors. And I, I like Michael's point of not even giving them a full full eye, but maybe a corner of an eye every now and again. Corner of an eye. Okay, that's a nice one. Thank you, Rafi. Alex, any last? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with everything there. I think I, 
I look at probably the competition too much when I'm when I'm in one particular vertical. I spend I, mm -hmm. I probably spend too much time sort of seeing what other people are doing. But I think the right way to do it is is similar to what what Michael and and Maddie are saying. It's sort of or, or roughly too. It's like keep an eye keep an eye on them, especially if they're doing big things. Learn from their mistakes. That's important, right? Sometimes people do yeah. these big launches that go nowhere, and you don't want to then do that. Um, and uh, and learn and see what you can borrow. See what you could borrow. There's there's always interesting things that you can take, but it but certainly not every day. Certainly not all the time. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, really like what what you said uh, much about uh, energy levels, right? But when you're looking you're looking at them, it just gives you like um, I don't know power, fire, fire, fire power to keep going. That's uh, but yeah, let's not get obsessive here. Thank you, guys. Uh, we have two three questions here. Let's, Susan, uh, Susan Burton, uh, he asked this very interesting question about B two B and sales uh, cycle time. Susan, do you want to um, again not judging, not pushing you? If you want to, yeah, uh, come on stage and ask your question, that would be uh, a bit more uh, uh, engaging. But but if if you don't feel comfortable, happy to read it for you. Hi guys, I didn't put any makeup on, so I'm feeling really brave right now. So my questions were relating just to that sales cycle. Don't come from an ed tech background. And um, now we've got someone on the board who is very ed educational focused and it's made such a difference to us. So that's just a little tip lesson that we've learned. Um, mm -hmm. But what we're finding is that these sales cycles, you know, we're, we're approaching head teachers and they're saying, yeah, yeah, we want it now, which means they want it in three to six months or maybe even next year. And it's like, you know, cash flow and all the other issues, that's that's really tough for us. Um, so just wanted to, to, to understand if there's any ways to speed that up. We we found that um, actually offering a discount helps with head teachers. Uh, yeah, yeah, you could you could sign up next year, but you know, if you sign up in a couple of weeks' time, you get this discount. So, you know, that's that's helped to accelerate the sales cycle. But it'd be good, great to understand also some benchmarks of, of what is um appropriate in terms of you know conversion rates you know if i'm prepared to share mine if, if somebody gives me a benchmark if it were way below that i won't but uh yeah. <laughs> those are the kind of things that we're tracking all the time is you know those market qualified leads sales qualified leads conversion to actual you know sale and then also activation of of those accounts so yeah that would be a great conversation enough from me okay. Thank you, Suzanne. Yeah. Anyone want to take this one? It's a tough one. I mean, I, I, I would just say like it's so, every company is so different that it's like, it's sort of, you know, it's really hard and the answer is ultimately depends just to like try and answer the question. I think in terms of reducing sales cycle, like, rather than a discount i would focus on product marketing like it's usually an articulation of the need not necessarily being urgent enough for them um, and there are actually quite a few studies out there to suggest that discounts don't always work they actually reduce the kind of perceived value in the eye of a of a customer so i would play more personally like if, if that was something we were thinking about i would play more with our product marketing and sharpening the need and the urgency versus um, offering a kind of cash discount. Yeah, I, I can offer some benchmarks, and then maybe Maddie has. Thank you, Rafi. Yeah, he's much more. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you. <laughs> I didn't cut you, right? No, 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 no uh, we're good. We're good. Okay, um, and then um, yeah, we're we're not super mature uh, on the B two B space. We're still exploring it. We have some nice revenue, but we could do much better. We have three levels. The first one is what we call a needs discovery slash alignment. We close about 20% of customers that are in that needs discovery slash alignment uh, phase. And then once a proposal is sent, we do about 70%, 70, uh, 70%, something like this. And the lead times are a pain in, in the butt. Uh, you're looking at, for anything that's under 50,000 euros, we're looking at three to six months. Anything that's uh, 100K and above, it could go up to a year. A uh, year, sometimes a year and a half. So super long-term investment. Our weighted pipelines are always screwed up, not because of the amounts, but because of the timing and stuff gets pushed back. 
One could argue that it's because the pain's not big enough. Actually, the pain's big, but there's so much internal alignment. And we're going after Fortune mm -hmm. 500 companies. So, you know, one time out of two, somebody quits their job while we're working on the, the deal. And then we need to rebuild up that relationship and you lose three to four months. We could be doing that much better, have a web of influence within the org, but it just takes a lot of personnel to set that up. And uh, yeah, those are kind of some of our, uh, our benchmarks at the moment. Yeah, we did hear that, that that SaaS businesses it should be over ten percent from that sort of market qualified lead to an actual sale. Uh, so I don't know whether we're kind of at becoming a SaaS type business. So I don't know if that's any other people's experience. Is that marketing qualified or sales qualified? Um, market qualified. Sound? Well, we're not there yet. <laughs> from Thank you. from yeah. No, no, it, go go for it. Go for it. No, no, sales qualified would make more sense to me, actually. I, I, I'll have to look back at my sources. Um, one quick thing I'd add, I, you, I think you mentioned head teachers wanted. So you, you, your model is selling to schools, not corporations, right? Oh, that's correct. Yes. So uh, one thing I would say, I was just looking at the sort of top tools being used in the US and the vast majority are either free, uh, they're Google, Wikipedia, Khan, or our uh, super freemium, they're, you know, Flipgrid, Kahoot, quizzes, Edpuzzle, things like that. So one thing I would say is, uh, you know, related to what Rafi said about this sort of urgency of the need, um, I would think really carefully about what you want to put sort of in front of and behind the paywall, because there may be a way to get into the classrooms and solve a really urgent need with your product, uh, whatever it is. Um, sooner in a sort of skunk works way. Teachers are, are often very, you know, willing to do that. And then they can, if you're really solving a need, they can become somewhat dependent and excited. And then, and then you can sort of scale up and over those three to six months over that year, you're getting all sorts of, you know, goodwill and ambassadors inside the school. A lot of, a lot of companies have grown that way. Class Dojo is a famous example, Nearpod um, had did some of that, but yeah, that, that would be my only uh, suggestion in terms of beta s thank you thank great you. thank you alex yeah look it's obviously well it depends right susan but i'm going to give you a range on, on, on the different um kind of a an, an official benchmark let's put it this way from discovery top of the funnel to really like proposal sent and closed look it varies I don't know you want it wasn't you want to call it marketing leads, sales leads, you name it the way you want. I don't I don't want to go and go into that, that level of details. But it's uh we've seen honestly like from five, which is terrible, five percent conversion, right? And up to the outstanding one. I still remember the name of the company, which was close to 70%. B2B 70% craziness. So out of 10, put it this way, leads, right? They would close seven. Uh, and big, big, uh, uh, and large contracts. So this is like the range. It's a massive, uh, I mean, a big one. Um, but yeah, roughly speaking, look, we're pretty happy. Um, uh, when I see on boards and B two B companies, when it when it's close to 30 40 percent, I'm super happy. Or when it's when it's there. But again, it's super subjective, and it depends on 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 the verticals and so on. So yeah, hope we we are answering your your question here. Um, if um, there is another interesting question here from Lan, uh, Lan, if you want to, yeah, go on to. Oh, sorry, so, Susanna, I didn't mean to interrupt or to cut you off <laughs> because I saw that you turn your video on. So if you have any comments or, or questions, please feel free to to jump back uh, on the stage. Um, otherwise, we can uh, move to the last question that we have here about Lan. Hey, thank you to give me yes. a chance to um, yeah. to put my questions yeah. ahead. Because um, mm -hmm. the solution that I I'm pursue or I I want to develop is very uh, personalized for individual students or um, children. And uh, my concern is that uh, the the sale or the buy power is in their parents' hand or the um, like in uh, many other case is in the um, school. Uh, but the end user or the beneficiaries of the solution is the uh, student or children. So the marketing focus, uh, I find it's very hard to, to decide or what would be the balance, what would be the indicator 
to help me focus the marketing fo- marketing effort in the to, to drive the growth. Thank you. Thank you. Lan. That's an interesting one. This is what we mentioned with Alex earlier, right? About like split marketing and so on. Look, rule of thumb, obviously, I'm, I'm, I don't have all the context here, but my two cents, uh, your feeling tells me that marketing, the product should be focused on end user, right? Obviously, because you want the students to love the product and, say, and tell their parents, hey, I'm so happy it works, I'm improving my grade, or whatever, right? But at the end of the day, uh, uh, the, the, the parents are the ones that are paying. So marketing should be focused on, on, on the parents. And this is what I've learned in the healthcare, uh, as I said, a space is that um, two different audiences. Uh, so the, the, our product, let's put it this way, was really targeted and focused on, on, on older adults. And the marketing was, uh, made, most of our marketing was focused on, um, on, on children, right? So completely different uh, uh, target audiences. But yes, yeah, so this is this is, and it worked. It worked for us. I don't know whether it's gonna work for you, but it it, it clearly worked. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Alex, you want um, something? Yeah. Uh, yeah, just I, I would I would agree that that you, you have to market to the people who can pay, but it is important to, especially when you're dealing with parents and children, to make sure that you know if a parent shows a kid <laughs> the, the site or the product that they are you know pretty quickly excited by it if it's too firmly on the side of you know this is just to improve your kids test scores and it'll get them into this college and this and that and and there's sort of nothing that looks engaging or fun in the marketing i, I think that you know you, you, there may be a balance there but i definitely agree with what david just said i you know i think that to me the one of the gold standard companies that's doing a really really good job of this right now is out school um, it's grown enormously, especially over the last couple of years, by marketing to parents for incredibly engaging experiences for kids. And if you look at their, you know, you look at their marketing push, they're doing direct mail, they're doing all sorts of, you know, uh, you know, marketing right now. And um, it's it's really a it's it hits it strikes this really nice balance of like they're talking to parents. They you know they they their tagline on their site is you know let kids curiosity run wild. But it's like they're using words like, you know, free and wild and anything you can imagine. And it, it, they're, they're going out of their way to make it something that is also kid friendly and can very easily be sort of you can convince a kid to at least try it. And then, like David said, you're in the product and you just have to make it so fun that the kids ask for more and want to subscribe or renew or keep going, whatever your whatever your model is. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Well, guys, if we, uh, apparently we don't have any more questions, so thank you, thank you, Matty, David, Michael, Rafi, and Alex. Thanks so much for be for joining us today, for sharing uh, great insights. Uh, it was great, super, super insightful. Uh, so we discussed about marketing strategies, about challenges, about uh, KPIs, obviously, and and many other topics. So hopefully, uh, the audience is leaving with a few actionable takeaways. Um, this, as Hege said, this will be this is recorded, so this will be available if you want to have access to the great uh, uh, materials that David uh, from, uh, in the first keynote uh, shared. Um, so thanks so much for joining us today, and um, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you, guys. Thanks for watching.